Tyler! Who, darling? You! Detective you? Not you, you! Who? You! Who? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Don't nobody understand the words that are coming out of your mouth, man! Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. I'm sure many of you have realized that a lot of what my channel is is a is a it is a criticism channel, positive and negative, but it's also a lot of skepticism. And I do think, for the most part, I am able to articulate and explain why certain things that are happening in comic books right now are not to my liking, and why I don't think they're exactly working. As far as whether it's storytelling, um, some of the marketing that they're doing, some of the gimmicks that they're having to use as far as uh, you know getting sales up and stuff today i want to talk about the things that i actually want the things that i look for in, in comic books or that i would want for the comic book industry that i think could really be healthy really be positive and provide some examples of what i think has worked in the in the recent past you know these things aren't really that old they're all uh have happened within a couple of uh last few years one of them is a little bit older than that but we'll, we'll get into that and then explain to them why i think they work why I think it's important and why they personally, uh, why these these things resonate with me and the things that I actually want from comic books. Today, I'm not gonna tell you why things aren't working. I'm gonna tell you what, what I think will work or certainly works for me. And I'm gonna have five of them today. And the first one is, I want creators that care about the characters in the universe. You could certainly extrapolate that or uh, understand that from some of my past criticisms of what's going on right now. But I think it is so important that the characters or the creators that you're putting on these characters absolutely care about the history, about the moral fabric, the core centerpieces of these characters. Otherwise, you're not going to get you know, really strong stories that make sense to the to the readers and fans that love the characters. They're also not going to make sense to new readers and new fans that are coming in and they're they're perhaps interested in comic books, but they're a little bit hesitant. Where do I start? Where do I start? Everyone, every comic book that's out there is potentially a, a first comic book for somebody. And if you've seen um, a character in animation or films or, or maybe in video games, and then you finally go into the comic books, you want to see the source material, you grab the wrong comic book, and it doesn't feel like that right character like well maybe this comic book thing isn't for me so i think it's really important that you that you get the right creators to aside with these characters especially the really important characters like your batmans your supermans your spider-man your x-men justice league kind of titles but it's also just as important you know for those those uh, you know c-list d-list kind of characters that you just don't get to see very often because you want it really authentic real portrayals of the characters. And one of the things I, I think that that um, DC especially, we'll see Marvel do it a little bit more now too, that they have the mechanism that they have for stories that don't exactly feel authentic or, or um, grassroots, kind of, uh, you know, maybe feel more astroturf. They, they, they don't really fit with the character. You do have these Elseworlds uh, ideas where you can play with characters um, and maybe take some more chances or do some things with the characters that um, you couldn't do in regular continuity. Well, one of the examples that I'll give here is as a creator that absolutely cares about the character. You can see it. He's actually creating his own version of that universe. So it's kind of Elseworlds. But the, the care that Sean Gordon Murphy put into Batman, specifically we'll talk about Batman White Knight Volume 1. Obviously, he's the, the writer artist on that one. Heavily influenced uh, by Batman the Animated Series. Obviously, heavily influenced by comic books. And the amount of care and love that is th is evident throughout that series is fantastic. If you were a new comic book reader and you picked up Batman White Knight, or let's say your dad got you a copy, you know, and, and said, hey, I think you would like this. You, 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 th you like Batman? Check this out. Or maybe your cousin gives it to you or something like that, or you just found it. And you found a copy of Batman White Knight and you were somewhat familiar with the character, you would understand the story, you would get the universe, and you would be deeply enthralled in the story. There's not going to be too many things that are introduced in there that are so alien to you that you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to understand. There's probably a, a few characters, especially like the Duke Thomas character, which certainly plays a big part in that story that might feel a little bit alien, but that's only one character that isn't really well known. Everything else 
know, those are evergreen characters that if you know anything about the Batman family, the Batman lore, you're going to know who Dick Grayson is. You're going to know who Barbara Gordon is. You're going to know who uh, Jim Gordon is. You're going to know who Joker is and all these villains and whatnot. And it's going to be fantastic. And once you finish that, you're going to be looking for the second volume. You're going to be looking for the other Batman stories that Sean Gordon Murphy has been involved in. You're going to start looking back to the classics and you're going to become a comic book fan. Even better, if you're someone like me or you're someone like Josh, who obviously uh, you know loves Batman character, and you read that, there's so much more to enjoy as someone that is has loved the character, loved the medium. When you get in there, there are so many cool Easter eggs. There's so many callbacks. There's so many little things, these little pieces of detail that Sean throws in the background of that story. So it's the perfect introductory story for a new reader, and it's even better for a reader that's been around for decades because you're getting all these wonderful little, uh, you know, trinkets, little treats that are, uh, you know, basically strewn throughout the, uh, the the comic book, and it also you know plays homage to the to the film universe as well. You get all those Batmobiles, you get the the coolest car chase scene possibly in comic book history in that in that comic book, and. Anyone, I think, that's a Batman fan, and they, I think, let's go 99%, because there's always the 1%, right? <laughs> Somebody's not going to like it, but I think a vast, vast, vast majority of Batman fans, when they went in there and they read Batman White Knight by Sean Gordon Murphy, and when they left it, you could tell there was a, not only is was there a quality of the creator uh, as far as a, a writer and an artist, but there was a love of Batman, a love of Gotham, a love of the Batman family, the, all the lore that goes along with the with the character. And sure, he was tweaking it, playing with it, and he was making it his own universe because it is, is Batman White Knight, not exactly in continuity. But you could see the love was there. And therefore, uh, as a reader, the, my love for that story is, is expanded because I know that Sean Gordon Murphy did something that he perhaps, you know, since he was five years old, maybe, you know, six years old, reading Batman for the first time, he'd been dreaming about his entire life. And that feels special. Not every, not everything is going to be to the level of Batman White Knight, but all the other creators should be striving for that kind of execution and that kind of um, love for the character, care for the universe when they're putting these stories out to where people, you know, um, can't help but feel the way can't help but see the way that the creator feels about the character and stuff like that. I think that's really important. Another thing that I definitely want for my comic books and I think is very important is I want stories that embrace the comic book medium. I've been talking about this on the channel where I do think there's been a dumbing down of comic book stories and comic book story craft where they're no longer embracing the medium um, and using it to its fullest, I think they're using the medium, um, you know, as a test ground or proof of concept for other things. I'm not going to get into that. I've talked about that enough. But there are so many cool things you can do with comic books. Like the comic book medium itself, I think, is the best storytelling medium in the world because it it literally takes like kind of the best, most of the best aspects of all the other storytelling mediums out there and combines them into one. You know, you get the, the wonderful uh, visual dynamics. Uh, you, you don't get, you know, solid motion like you do in a film, but you get these great visuals and, you know, these poses and everything. But there are, there's, no, uh, there's no budget effects. There's nothing keeping a creator from, from making something bigger and better than that has ever seen before. You know, when you look at um, as far as novels, you end up in reading so much exposition that is describing, you know, the scenery and, and how the character is interacting with it. You get to see that in a comic book. You don't have to, to read through all that. You get to absorb it. You get to feel it. That you can see the texture of, of the like of the wood that's around the character, how they're interacting with it. And I think that really um, makes it a more vibrant, exciting, uh, you know, experience as you're you're consuming the story. But you can also still, you know, you can see the thoughts. Of of the character, you can you can see you can see what the character is thinking. You don't get that in a movie, but you can still get that in a comic book. You know, and you can still do the the narration or whatnot 
which you certainly see in, in movies and in, um, in novels. And, you know, you also get the, the wonderful things that you get with television where it's kind of episodic. You get these contained little stories and maybe there's a bigger story that's going on throughout there. And I love, love, love stories that embrace the medium and don't dumb it down for consumers coming from other mediums or to impress people in other mediums to come over and, and potentially see it as like a proof of concept. The example here that I want to talk about is from, I think it's Aftershock Comics, the Miranda Brothers, who co-wrote it. I believe it's um, Inaki Miranda illustrated it. I might have that wrong. But it's called We Live. And it's an absolutely fantastic story. And if you look at the, the cover, it looks like it's a kid's comic book. It is not. There are kids in the comic book, and the kids are the protagonists. But they are put through the ringer. They, you know, it is one of the most dangerous lived in worlds that you'll see in a comic book. And for these kids to end up having to traverse it to kind of hoping to save like the human race, you know, in this story is fantastic. And you get these, these insane creatures with these, you know, with these, uh, you know, creature designs that the artist put into it. And it would cost so much money. If you wanted to take, we live and do like a really fat faithful adaptation visually wise, into a streaming show or into a movie, it would be one of the most expensive shows or movies ever made because the Miranda brothers didn't dumb down the story or the, the environment that the story takes place in, you know, so that they could pitch it somewhere else. They said, this is a fucking comic book and we're going to use the comic book medium to its very fullest. We're not take, we're not taking any shortcuts. We, we have comic book fans coming in to read this story, and you're going to see the most insane graphics. You're going to see the most insane creatures. You're going to see uh, some of the, the most wonderful world building that is going to make you not only uh, fall in love with these characters because you like the way that we developed them, but you're going to fall in love with these characters because we built up the stakes and the world around them, and it feels like you're completely immersed in it. And that's an ex experience that I, you know, you get it with all mediums, but. When I come to a comic book, I want that experience. The the the, the consumption you know, that only comic books can can provide you, right? There are certain things that movies can't do. There, there are things television can't do. There are things that books can't do. That 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 comic books can't. And when you when you cut those things out, you're doing you're doing a disservice to your story. You're just doing doing a disservice to your, to the medium. If you want to make a Netflix show, go make a Netflix show. If you want to make a comic book, make a goddamn comic book and do it to its fullest. Another thing that we've seen, you know, it's been, you know, kicking up and this is mostly like a big two problem is we do see a lot of comic book events. And I think events are cool. Like, even, you know, um, like I, I like King and Black. I think that was cool. That was good. But it wasn't great. You want to know why it wasn't great? There's no like, there's still like status quo change. There was fallout, but you know, two weeks later, you know, it, it's almost like it never happened because you know, there's there's another event coming up. Events need to matter. You know, if you want people to get in there and be, you know, jaws on the floor, like I can't believe what I just read. What is going to happen next? What is the fallout of this? What are the ramifications of what just happened? And really, you know, have people. You know, talking for months on end that they, you know, what are the, you know, what are the, 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 what exactly has changed here is, is the big thing. If comic book events really need to matter. And then I'm going to have an example from DC and uh, from Marvel, and they're both a little bit different. When I go back to DC, DC Universe Rebirth, obviously it was a one shot, Jeff Johns with a bunch of different artists as they were reintroducing Wally West to the DC Comics universe as the symbol of hope, also hinting at the integration of the Watchmen into the DC universe. So those are some really big things. We hadn't seen Wally for quite some time. People wanted Wally West back. You know, you have the Watchmen is the most influential comic book, and a lot of people think the greatest comic book of all time, introducing them into the proper DC Comics universe. Those are really important. Also, the hint at... And the reminder that Batman and the, the three Jokers are still out there. That thing did a lot of stuff. And 
Uh, another thing DC did to make that thing special was the price on it. They made it so cheap for the, the amount of uh, product that you were getting and, and for the quality of it. And there's a reason following DC Rebirth, because of the quality of the of DC Universe Rebirth, the ideas that are introduced, it got people so excited. They knew this wasn't the DC Comics Universe that they were reading the week prior to DC Universe Rebirth. Everything had changed, and it got people excited. And DC, uh, you know, obviously went out there and kicked Marvel's butt for for quite some well, not as long as they would have liked, but they did kick their butt. People were were very interested in it. People were happy to see the the characters that they loved. They wanted to see Wally Buzz back. How are we going to introduce the 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 Watchmen universe? Where what does the three Jokers mean? And it all felt like it was leading to something, and people were able to buy into it. Unfortunately, it's comic books. They ended up uh, dropping the ball. But DC Universe Rebirth felt important when you read it. And you don't get that enough uh, anymore. As far as Marvel goes, the last event that I think felt important and really had you know ramifications is Marvel Civil War. I mean... One of the craziest ideas where you got heroes fighting heroes and not just well a hero fighting a hero. You have two massive hero teams, you know, fighting over the uh, Superhero Registration Act. You know, you, Team Cat versus Team Iron Man. And when that event was over, the Marvel Universe was different. It was darker, but it certainly had changed. It wasn't the Marvel Universe The the week prior to Marvel Civil War starting was completely different than the Marvel Universe the week after Marvel Civil War was over. That's important. That gets people talking about. That's worth investing in. And you just don't see that. Even in um in a in a you know uh, King and Black, which I enjoyed and I think is good. You know, the, the event cycle is so fast that you, you don't even get to breathe and think about all the things that happen and really get to play it out within the comics and the universes to show people um, that it was important and things have changed. So I think events really need to matter. Another thing I, I really appreciate in comic books, and I, I like miniseries. I really do. I think miniseries are great because you know you're getting one story. And it's kind of contained, even if it's in continuity, you know, it's almost like you're, you're writing for the trade, but I know you've advertised it that way. That way I don't feel hoodwinked when that's what happens. And, you know, I think miniseries are great, but I think extended runs with creators, hopefully a writer and an artist are really important for these characters in these universes. If you just have writers coming in and doing, well, I'm going to do 12 issues of Guardians of the Galaxy, or I'm going to do 15 issues of this, how are they ever going to accomplish anything? You know, uh, in order to build up the stakes, you have to to, uh, to lay a foundation. You have to have a couple of, of key inciting events. You, you know, maybe the hero doesn't quite make it, or he learns something as, uh, you know, um, as he fails a time or two, and then you get the big conflict. You can't really do that really successfully in a short amount of time you need nice long extended runs and we do get them from time to time we got chip sadarsky he's gone into uh about three years on daredevil obviously tom king with with batman whether you not you're a fan of that one uh is up to you we do get them here and there but a lot of times everything feels like a mini series especially if it's not batman or if it's not spider-man obviously nick spencer got a pretty good extended run that would have been longer if he hadn't taking that Substack deal. But um, the example here I'll use is Robert Menditti's, you know, Hawkman run, which ended up being 29 issues. Uh, an, an ongoing Hawkman series going over two years is kind of successful. Unfortunately, um, they didn't have the sales that, they, that, that it deserved because the series was so good. But he was able to execute and accomplish so much in that, that amount of time, you end up getting one of the best modern... Uh, DC stories, in my opinion, the first 12 issues of Hawkman, really that's three stories, but one big story arc, where you have Brian Hitch on art, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, in my opinion, that's the it's the best Hawkman story I've read. I haven't read them all. I'm not I'm not Hawkworld, Tim Board, but I have read quite a few. You know, I've read Jeff Johns, I've read uh, Hawkworld, I, I've read uh, some of that older stuff, and I, I think it it 
stands up with all that and, and kind of exceeds it. And we get this wonderful ending, you know, as you've sat there, you know, for over two years with Robert Venditti on Hawkman. And when you finally get to issue 29, you know, I wish it would have gone out to issue 60. It would have been great if it had been a five-year run. It would have been even better. But it, when you finally get that ending, it's really emotional. It, it hits you because you've been there, uh, you know, with the writer, with the creative team. And, and he gets this really nice long run to explore the character. You know, I know how Robert Venditti feels about Hawkman because of the, the, the 29 issues that we got together. And that he got with the character. And I think that stuff's important. And it really builds. Um, it, it gives readers a chance to believe in the character. Or start buying into these things. Because when you're rebooting so often. It's it's so easy to, to go like. Oh, why even read the next generation? You know, they're, they're never going to go past 12 issues. So I think it's really important to get nice extended long runs. Not just, you know, with the um, the numbering of the series, but with the creator on it. We're never going to get the the Chris Claremont X-Men like 13 years again. You know, Todd McFarlane on Spawn is is fantastic, but we're not that's that's not in the cards. But we can get some some longer extended runs and DC and Marvel really need to look into that and make sure that uh, they're treating their, their characters right and letting the, the fans know because it, it tells the fans Yes, you can invest in our characters. Yes, you can invest in our creators because we're invested in them too. And I think it um, it builds a bit of trust, which I just don't think is there right now. And the last thing that I really want from comic books, and this is maybe, it is part of what I want in a comic, but this is more like of the industry. I want my voice to be heard and I want it to be taken seriously. I don't want, um, I don't want, to just be dismissed or um, be pushed to the side is is unimportant. It's they've had you know letters columns in in comic books for a very long time, specifically so that the publisher and the creator could let the the fans know that we hear you. We always had uh, you know Stan Lee would have his Stan soapbox. And let the fans know that you are just as important to the success of Marvel Comics as I am and the creators here and the characters. You're a part of the experience. And it feels like that has been lost. Which is insane when you think about the world that we live in today. We're all more connected now than we ever have been at any other moment in the entire universe. You know, on this planet. And it feels like we're further away from each other than we ever have been. And I, I think that's too bad that um, any type of criticism is, is dismissed. They, they, you try to find what's the worst possible motive, motive for the criticism so I can you know, dismiss it outright. It's not uh, good for the readers. It's not good for the creators. It's not good for the, for the universes. It's not good for anybody. And I think a lot of people are in the same boat. I think they also want to be heard. They don't want to be dismissed. And the example here I'll go with is Chip Zdarsky. If you read his very first volume of Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man, it is awful. The jokes do not flow correctly. They actually interrupt the story. And it's just, it's a mess. I think it's the first, it's the first three or four issues. It is absolutely atrocious. I accidentally bought the damn thing on Comixology and, you know, I read uh, one and a half issues on. I'll never read it again. It was so bad. I had people say, you need to read Chip Zdarsky's Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man. I said, are you nuts? I read the first issue and a half and they were terrible. They were like, listen, he got, you know, people, he got feedback via social media and, and I imagine he got it from his editors and, and whatnot. And, and, they, and he got criticism on the execution of those first few issues of Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man. And they said he's a completely different writer after that. You know, starting at, at this one issue, you know, it's where um, they start, you know, jump through multiverses and he's with uh, J. Jonah Jameson. And I had enough people that I respected keep, tell me this, so I went back and, and, and uh, jumped back on board. And it's one of the best decisions I've ever made as a comic book reader. It was night and day. You could see that Chip Zdarsky, I don't know that, you know, I don't, 
I don't go, well, Chip Zdarsky, no one loves fans more than Chip Zdarsky other than Stan Lee. I don't get that feeling about him, but he clearly heard what the, the readers of the comic book had to say. And he adjusted to it, and we got one of the best modern Spider-Man s- stories that you'll ever get. You know, the, the run is fantastic after that first volume. And that very last issue, which I believe is Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man 310, is one of the best comic books in modern history. He wrote it. He illustrated it. It's a love letter to Peter Parker. It exemplifies why Peter Parker is one of the greatest heroes in the history of fiction. He's one of the greatest superheroes in uh, you know U.S. comic book history. And if you go read that story, and it's an earned moment because Chip Zdarsky turned it around. He heard the criticism. He listened to the voice of the people that were actually buying the comic book. And he changed. He adjusted. And when he got to that very last issue and he knew it was the last issue of Chip Zdarsky on there, you felt like you were losing something. And you could, you could, when you read it, it, you could tell he felt like he was losing something too. All you have to do is listen to the fans. Are they right every time? Absolutely not. There's, there are going to be some fans that you know have the some of the more odd takes. I know Donny Cates got a lot of negative feedback over uh, the relationship between uh, Venom and Eddie Brock. That, that was weird feedback. But if you hear a consistent tone, like your jokes aren't working with Peter Parker, uh, you, your, your plotting is off, the, the pacing is different, you need to adjust things. You know, if you're getting that consistent feedback, it's probably correct. And, you know, it is, it's something that you, you need to listen to. It. You need to hear it because you'll never get better and you'll never get an opportunity to have what Chip Zdarsky had with Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man number 310, which is pretty much the perfect comic book. He would not have gotten to read that or write that and illustrate that comic book and have it be that meaningful and that fantastic. If you haven't read it, go read it today. You're going to love it just as much as I do, I think. But you have to listen to the fans to be able to have that kind of moment. Because if you just sit there in your own little bubble thinking that you can do nothing wrong, you'll never get better and you'll never get to have that connection, not with only with the character, but with the fans as well. And I think it's really important. So those are five things that I, I really want from comic books. I think I had some examples in there. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from better. We're not going to agree on all these things. There are going to be other things that you want. I definitely want to hear from you guys. What are some of the things that you want from comic books from, from the medium itself, from the creators, from the, from the industry? Let me know in the comment section. Let's have a conversation on that. So those are five, my five. I want, creators that care about the characters in the universe. I want stories that embrace and utilize the comic book medium to its fullest. I want events. If you're going to do an event, make sure it matters. I want extended runs on characters with great creators, hopefully writers and artists. And then, you know, I want my voice to be heard. I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be ignored. You know, I have valid criticism and I, and uh, you know, Listening to the fans and the readers can only help the story, in my opinion. 